Good morning, everybody. There, the mic wanted to activate itself. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm your virtual adventure guide here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and welcome back to our slate of programs. We are uh, headlong into 2023. This has been just an incredible week live from California, the Philippines, Costa Rica, India. Uh, it's been an incredible adventure, and I am so thankful for all of you for continuing to join us as we showcase the coolest scientists, explorers, and organizations really just around the world. Last year, we did over 500 programs programs together. So a big thank you to you for uh, keeping us going and helping us share these stories. I'm really excited to have you back. And for our new teachers in the audience today, welcome to all we do here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Now, before we dive in today, I will note that we do have a Kahoot together. So a little interactive quiz between our talk and our Q&A portion. So if you want to pull up Kahoot.it with the game pin below, I will put this in our YouTube chat in a minute as well. And for all our friends joining us live on StreamYard, that'll be a fun way of keeping the engagement going uh, after Joe's main presentation. Now, it's my great pleasure today to get to introduce for the first time ever in a broadcast or we're jointly in it, Joe Grabowski. He is the founder of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, the person behind this whole shebang where we get to, again, feature all these incredible stories. And I'm so excited to welcome him today to share his story of his great adventure in November to the Osa Peninsula. So this is one of the most biodiverse parts of one of the most biodiverse countries in Costa Rica on this planet. So today he's going to share some of his incredible pictures, videos, and stories from an adventure to a really, really special place on this planet. I hope you guys are as excited as I am. Uh, we'll all buckle up together. And without further ado, Joe, welcome into the broadcast. I'll let you bring yourself in because you know, we don't press the button at the same time. But come on right. in, man. <laughs> Can't wait yes, to see you. Yeah. I'm great. I'm, I'm personally excited. I mean, I'm happy for the kids, but I'm excited to see these pictures and hear these stories too. So I'll be in the background with some popcorn. All Let's right. Thanks for the great intro. And uh, big shout out to all our classrooms today. Great uh, to have you joining us. You are the guinea pigs today. This is the first time that I've done this presentation. So I don't know if it's going to be too long or too short, but either way, it's jam packed with tons of great images and stories uh, and video clips. And obviously, I'm really excited for your questions when the time comes. So a uh, little bit really quickly about me, as Jesse mentioned, I founded Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I am a National Geographic Explorer, fellow with the Explorers Club, uh, and on their board of directors. And I was an educator. I taught math and science to grade seven and eight students for about seven years before I started Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So I was really lucky. In November, I got the opportunity to visit Costa Rica, and more specifically, the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica. So I'm going to share my screen now, and uh, I am going to go full screen on this so that you can get a feel uh, for what we're getting up to. All right. So this is a map of Costa Rica. You can see that on top of it is Nicaragua, and then down below is Panama, and right sandwiched in between is the country of Costa Rica. More specifically, I visited this little piece right here where my mouse is. This is the Osa Peninsula uh, in Costa Rica. Now, uh, it is pretty far to get to. So here's San Jose. This is the capital. This is where we flew into. And to get here, to drive would take you over eight hours. And then to get into the Osa Peninsula, there really isn't any roads. It's You need a four by four. You have to cross rivers. It's pretty crazy to get into driving, which is why it's so protected. So it's a good thing. But I took a little plane to do there. I took a little flight. So here's my tiny little plane. Uh, there were four of us on the plane in total, plus the pilots. Uh, and this we took about an hour to get to the Osa Peninsula from San Jose. And you can see this view here, this mountainous terrain. You can see the rainforest. And then as you were kind of leaving San Jose, you could see that a lot of kind of this rainforest was cleared. There's a lot of people that live there. There's lots of farms. But then as you got closer and closer to the Osa Peninsula, these kind of mountaintops were greener uh, and more untouched. So just a few really quick pictures uh, of the Osa Peninsula here. Uh, it's right where the rainforest meets the ocean. So you've got these two incredible ecosystems interacting with each other. Uh, you can see this kind of view over the rainforest, kind of a cloudy day, misty, a little bit of rain falling like you'd expect. And of course, a huge diversity of plant species. Rain uh, forests full of waterfalls and rivers and creeks running through. And then I stayed in this beautiful spot called Lapa Rios. Um, and there's a small little group of tree houses in the rainforest and all connected by this crazy boardwalk that every day you'd walk along this boardwalk through the treetop 
and you would see birds and monkeys and frogs and you can see this howler monkey making its way uh, across one of the, the railings there. And so I want to play a little video to start. The sound's not really important. I'll probably talk a little bit over the video just so you can I can tell you a little bit about what you're seeing. But I want to show you a little video of some cool rainforest stuff. So this is right on my deck one morning. This is a white collared peccary that came up and was eating some of the, the roots uh, and the stems of some of the trees, the little plants. Here we've got a nice little hummingbird shot. You can see how quickly they move as they're going from plant to plant. They can, on average, beat their wings about 50 times per second, which is pretty wild. We've got the leafcutter ants, and these are everywhere, nonstop, busy all day long, trails everywhere uh, as they carry their leaves back to their nests where they're farmers. So they take these leaves, they chew them up, and they grow fungus. So they eat the fungus uh, that grows on the leaves that they bring back. So you can just see that they're just working, working, working all day long, taking those leaves back. The bigger ones are protectors, soldier ants. So you can see those kind of moving through the groups. And then at night, in this next little clip, you'll see that they come out even more at night. This huge crew working nonstop uh, through the rainforest. Here we've got some capuchin monkeys jumping through the trees. I don't know if you saw, but that one had a baby on its back. You can see how comfortable they are in the trees. These are squirrel monkeys. We're gonna talk about, there's four types of monkeys in Costa Rica. We're gonna to get to talk about all four of them shortly. But here's just a little video of some of these squirrel monkeys. And here, some of you may have visited Osa Conservation with us. We do great events with them where they're up in the tree canopy forest and things like that. So I was able to visit them and hang out with them, see some sea turtles. And this is the, actually the back of their kitchen. You can see the squirrel monkeys all over uh, this spot. And those little squeaks are from the squirrel monkeys. All right. Moving right along. The morning. The morning is the best time. Well, there's three really good times to explore the rainforest. The morning. Then at dusk when the sun is starting to go down. And then, of course, at night. During the day, it gets really hot. Uh, and a lot of the animals are resting taking shelter to avoid that heat. But in the morning, it's a bird paradise. And I want to show you a few birds here. We've got uh, a velvety mannequin here. And then we've got a different species here of mannequin. This is a red cap mannequin. And if you have time afterwards, look these guys up online. Look for the moonwalk bird. These males do a crazy uh, mating dance for the females. Uh, that's very much like the moonwalk. So it's pretty cool. Check that out. This is a trogan and... Uh, another early morning bird. You can see how beautifully colored the male is to attract a female. Very common are these tropical kingbirds. So they're a fly catcher. So they're all over the place on fence posts, up in the trees. Uh, and they are very much catching flies out of the air. They're pretty good uh, acrobats. We've got our parrots. Our, this is our red lord parrot uh, here and a little bit of the sun rising in behind. This tons of tanagers, all kinds of different species of tanagers. This happens to be a red rump tanager. This is a male. And then the female is kind of brown and her head has a little bit of orange uh, in it. These are roadside hawks. These roadside hawks are very common all throughout Costa Rica. And you'll find them on the side of the road because there's cleared areas and it's a lot easier for them to look for something to eat, look for prey. And that's something you see all day long in the rainforest is animals eating. It could be herbivores eating plants, but a lot of the times you get to catch some interactions where predators uh, are hunting and eating other animals. And I have a few photos coming later up uh, to showcase some of that. And you can see that this hawk is looking down. It's very focused on the ground. And this is why a couple seconds later, it pounced uh, down onto the ground and it caught this little lizard. So a nice early morning snack. And unfortunate for this little 
uh, and all. And then beautiful owl, we caught first thing in the morning. These are spectacled owls. And if you've ever visited uh, with us when we visited the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica, uh, we visit these guys from time to time. And sometimes when they go in to feed these owls, they have to wear helmets because they're not very friendly owls uh, and they're known to dive bomb with those big talons. So uh, you don't want to get too close to those. This area is where you can find one of the largest populations of scarlet macaws, these beautiful, beautiful parrots. In fact, Lapa Rios, where we stayed, uh, translates from Spanish to the river of macaws, river uh, of macaws, because at the right time of the year, it's like a river of these beautiful colored birds flying through the sky uh, all throughout the day. And then if you're lucky, you can catch them like this, where they're in the sky uh, and flying, and they're always in pairs. You hear them way before you see them. They're very loud. And then they're always in pairs, and they mate for life. So they're always with their mate. If you see a group of three, you know that one of them is their young from that year. One of them is the young uh, parrot that they raised. And then they're always munching, so they really love these almond trees. You can see they've got these big, powerful beaks to get through those tough uh, shells uh, on those almonds. And then they you have to watch out because they'll drop the, the empty parts right on your head if you're not paying attention. And then it's fun to catch them in the air too, the beautiful spread of their tails uh, as they fly right towards you. Now let's switch gears. We talked about some birds. Let's talk about the mammals. We were just talking about the Toucan Rescue Ranch where we've seen three-fingered sloths. We've seen two-fingered sloths but it was so cool to get an opportunity to see them in the wild. So this is a two fingered sloth and you can see that little piggy nose that we're used to seeing with the Toucan Rescue Ranch. And you can't see in this picture, but uh, this is a mother and she actually had a little baby on her belly, uh, which was really cool to see. And then there is our second species. Here is our three fingered sloth. And so this one here is larger and you can see that the fur looks really green. And that's because that fur is home to algae. There's plants growing in that sloth's fur. So the fur of that sloth is an ecosystem with other insects living within it, which is really cool. And so we caught this guy down low. Sloths, once a week, they come down to the ground to go to the bathroom. And when they do that and go to the bathroom, you can see on the head, there's this little moth here. These little moths live in their fur. And then when the sloth goes to the bathroom, they fly down, they lay their eggs in the sloth poop, and then they jump back into the fur uh, of the sloth. So the, the fur is just this amazing ecosystem, this green kind of punk rock hairdo uh, that this sloth has. Now, endemic species are found all throughout the tropics, uh, especially a place like the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica. So an endemic species is something found nowhere else in the world. So it might be in just one country, it might be in one tiny spot uh, in one country or a tiny island. So this is a beautiful example. This is a poison frog, poison dart frog, and it is the Golfo Duce frog. And so it's only found on the Osa Peninsula. This is actually in the shower. So there's an outdoor shower uh, on our treehouse. And when I turn the shower on, this uh, came out, this is a male. And if you look very carefully on its back, you can see a little tadpole. So the male is carrying the tadpole. It's going to climb up into a tree and look for a bromeliad, which is kind of like a green plant, almost makes like a cup shape. And there's little bits of water that are saved in them. And so the frog will bring its tadpole to that little bit of water, nice, safe, cool spot, uh, and will bring food as well to the frog, uh, its tadpoles, which is pretty cool. Going out at night, I told you, is amazing. The frogs at night are so cool. We've got this um, gladiator frog here sitting on the treetop here, beautiful black eye uh, in the night. And here's a mask tree frog sitting kind of at the side of a pond. Actually, if you look really carefully in the top corner here, there's a little tadpole uh, in the pond there. Actually, another one down there. Nice little close up here to show those cool eyes uh, of the tree frogs. This is actually a rain frog. So it's another, it's a different species. And then this is what I was really looking for. I was really hoping to get a chance to photograph the red-eyed tree frog. 
and they lay their eggs on the tips of leaves. Uh, and then they'll hatch from there. It's right, they do it right over top of little ponds or, or rivers. And then when the eggs hatch, the tadpoles fall into the river. Also, they've got this cool kind of defense mechanism. Snakes are always on the lookout for frogs to eat, but they're also looking for their eggs to eat. And these cat-eyed snakes that we saw throughout the rainforest, when they start to eat the frog eggs, there's kind of a little chemical signal sent to the other eggs and they immediately start dropping into the water, which is kind of a cool uh, defense mechanism that those eggs have. And this little baby raccoon, I wasn't expecting raccoons in the rainforest, but here we go. And this baby raccoon, while we were walking around, kind of came out of nowhere and climbed onto my Wellington, my boots, uh, and then kind of moved on. So I'm not sure if it was lost or what was going on, but uh, being lost in the rainforest as a baby raccoon is not, not a good thing. And because there's always hunters kind of on the prowl. And this is a chunkhead snake. And it has caught this anole. It's a male anole because you can see the yellow dewlap there at the bottom. It uses to signal females. And unfortunately for this anole, uh, it is going to be a feast for this uh, lucky chunk snake. And then here's a gecko that's just caught a katydid. So this katydid is, is on its way down into that gecko stomach. There's other hunters out there at night, like the scorpions. And the scorpions are on the prowl for these guys, these whip spiders. So these whip spiders are related to the scorpions, but they're also a good meal for the scorpions. Uh, and you see on the scorpion, they have this, this tail and that little barb there. They've got a nice bit of venom in here uh, that'll have a huge impact on whatever they're hunting. So back to the day, I told you we visited Osa Conservation. And one of the first things we did was go out to the beach. Uh, beautiful miles and miles and miles of untouched protected beach, no homes, no resorts, just beach and rainforest. And they have a turtle hatchery there. Sea turtles are in huge trouble. There's seven species of sea turtles. They're all um, endangered. And when they hatch and make their way to the sea, it may seem like a lot. Each nest has a hundred sea turtles, but in reality, one of those sea turtles, one in every a thousand, uh, will make it to adulthood. So this is a kind of an extra boost for them by taking the eggs, putting them in the hatchery, and then releasing the sea turtles when they hatch, it gives them kind of a head start, a little bit of a boost. So these are all of Ridley sea turtles. Uh, you can see we've collected some up. And then they head down to the beach. They kind of stand close. Uh, the conservationist down there just to keep the birds away and give the sea turtles a chance to work their way down to the beach. And you can see this one heading there down to the water. It's a big trip. And I've got a little video clip. I took a little bit of drone footage and then a little bit of the turtle. So let's take a little look at these beaches and the hatchery. So this is called Piro Beach. You can see there is nothing but Pacific Ocean, uh, rainforest, sandy beaches, nobody around. There's no people here. This is, Osa Conservation has over 3,000 hectares of protected land. So this is a great spot to protect and preserve the biodiversity. So you can see this beautiful view we're having here over the ocean, these massive waves breaking from the Pacific. Pretty cool to see. And then we're going to get a view of the hatchery here. So here at the hatchery, we've got, um, I forget the number, probably about 100, just over 100 nests. You can see one of the conservationists there and they have excavated a new nest. They've got all the eggs in the bucket and now they're putting those eggs into a nest in the hatchery. They're going to cover it over, uh, mark when it went in. And then every day they come into the hatchery, walk along the rows, and look to see if any of the nests are hatching. And it's fully screened in and protected. It keeps the predators uh, away. And so here's one of our friends making their way down to the ocean. Here they go. Almost there. And then they get a big assist here from the waves. And they're gone. So uh, 
toucan. Beautiful toucans in Costa Rica. Two in the Osa Peninsula. This is the fiery build Aracari. I think you can see why it gets its name. And then we also have the chestnut mandible toucan. And you can see this one here eating a little bit of fruit. They're also called yellow-throated toucans. And you can see that mandible. It's actually really light that they have there. And then they play with their food. So they pick off little fruit pieces and they throw it up in the air and they catch it and swallow it. So they like to play with their food. And watching them fly is hilarious. They pretty much just dive bomb. You think, oh my gosh, are they going to open their wings? Are they going to fly? Uh, but eventually they do this. They whip their wings open uh, what seems like the last second and manage to land gracefully uh, on the next branch that they're looking for. We saw a little video of a hummingbird. There's beautiful species, these little jewels kind of zipping through uh, the rainforest. I mentioned that they beat their wings on average 50 times per second. The maximum is 80 times and the minimum, the giant hummingbird does 10 times a second, but on average it's 50 times per second. You can see these beautiful creatures nice and close up and flying in the rain. And to end, I just wanna talk about the monkeys for a minute or two. There's four species of monkeys. Here's the first one. This is the white-faced capuchin. And you can see they're very curious creatures. This one's sitting on a rooftop. And then they move through the forest by jumping. They love to jump from tree to tree. So you can see this one is planning things out, calculating the distance, crunching the numbers. And then here we go. Leap into the air. And then a successful landing in that palm tree. Looking at the monkeys, it's always fun to see them with their babies. So here's a nice little baby holding on to mom while she eats. She forages in the treetops. Sometimes they don't like to have their picture taken. They give you a little piece of their mind, um, like this one. And they're always eating. So tasty looking bugs and fruit and things like that that they find in the treetops. We have our howler monkeys. Our howler monkeys are so cool. The males have these huge pouches and make these wild uh, howling sounds all day long, but especially in the morning. In fact, they start every morning at five in the morning. Uh, it's this crazy wake up call. And I wanna play that for you now. I have a little clip here. All right, that's the sound. We have a mum with their baby, of course. We don't want to leave that out. And then we move to our spider monkeys, the third species in Costa Rica. Oh my gosh, I could watch these spider monkeys all day long. They've all, usually the mothers always have a baby hanging on somewhere, uh, like this one here, who's very curious about its own tail. And watching the mother in the trees, so fearless with the baby clinging on, it's kind of scary sometimes because you think the baby's going to fall. But the mother is always using their limbs and their fifth limb, this prehensile tail, is always grabbing onto things like an anchor. So you can see, just watch, look at the way this mother moves through the tree and the baby's just hanging on uh, the back for dear life. Moving through, hang time, hanging around. It's just kind of scary, but kind of awesome to see the way uh, they move through the trees and you've got that little baby there just hanging on to mom and figuring things out, learning for itself, watching what mom eats and things like that. And at the late afternoon, they kind of all bunch together and they have these little naps. And we already met our final species. We have our squirrel monkey. So here's a couple pictures of those squirrel monkeys uh, hanging out in the trees. They're a very small species, little chirp when they're alarmed. So that's the four species, the white-faced capuchin, the howler monkey, the squirrel monkey, and the spider monkey. All right. Well, that is what I wanted to share with you today, a little whirlwind trip through some of the biodiversity of Costa Rica. Uh, I am ready for your questions. I know we have a Kahoot quiz. So Jesse, let's get to it. 
Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, man. And I, I didn't know how their monkeys are quite, they sound very, it's vaguely horrifying. I don't know if that's the actual sense of it when you're actually there, but it's kind of a, a scary sound through the bush. And everything has a baby. I've never seen a place where everything, there's so many tadpoles and baby monkeys and lizards all over the place. It's a very, as we said, a really rich and, and biodiverse place. It's very exciting. Um, as Joe mentioned, we are going to play our Kahoot. I'll pull this up for everyone. A lot of you are already in the Kahoot, which is great. If you are new to Cahoots, the faster you answer, the more points you get. You do not win anything, but you do win Joe and I's everlasting respect, which is pretty, I think it's a pretty good thing. It shows that you paid attention, listened to the presentation. Uh, and then when we're done that, we're going to dive in with our Q&A together. I will quickly note, because Joe mentioned them a couple times throughout the broadcast, osaconservation.org and toucanrescueranch.org. If you want to learn more about these incredible organizations, we partner with them all the time. You can check out many broadcasts we've done with them on our YouTube channel. But if you guys are ready, I am ready too. Let's start with our first question. Joe, maybe you can give us hints as we get to our final seconds uh, for each of these here. But so many of you are in already. That's great, guys. All right. Starting in three, two, one. Which country? We talked a lot about some of the species that are there. In the beginning, we talked about what country, but who remembers? Panama, Brazil, Costa Rica, or Colombia? Oh, one of the answers coming in. They're all countries I listed in Central America and South America to kind of give students pause. Uh, but I think this will be a nice, easy softball to get started. <laughs> so what everyone thinks in the first two. We'll find out together. It was an easy softball. Most of you got this right. Way to go. Let's see our, our leaderboard. Fuzzy Fox, currently in the lead. Way to go. If you are any of these people at the end, please do let us know who you are. We'd love to give a shout out to your class or the student. So true or false, endemic species is found all over the world. Everywhere. That frog, you can find it in Canada, Australia, Antarctica. I don't know. What do we think? I like seeing the students in classes answering, like busy with individual devices when they have them. So it's always an enjoyable part. Three, two, one, 94 of you in. This is so exciting. We're almost at 100 Kahooters today. So the answer is false, but a little less of a softball one. So endemic species, Joe, to reiterate, are species that are found in, in one specific area that are sort of unique to that region. Yeah, and then if they're found all over the world, it's pandemic. So the difference between the two terms. Endemic, yeah, not, one spot, pandemic, all over the place. Well, we're not talking about pandemics anymore. We're happy to be back in the class. Come on now. Blue Gazelle takes our lead. Uh, how often do sloths come down to poop? This is the second day in a row that I've had a question on this. We did two cameras to your yesterday. So who's paying attention? Is it once a day, once a week, once a month, or once a year? I think this is just a burning question for classrooms. They want to know how often sloths poop. We do. That's, in fact, all animals. That was my uh, youthful biodiversity research in a nutshell. 94 answers. The answer is once a week. And most of you got this right. Way to go. 75% correct. That's awesome. Does it change our leaderboard at all? Nope. Lou Gazelle maintains the lead. Way to go. Proud works right behind. Uh, let's go to our fourth of five questions. And then Miss Arlene's class. We're coming to you guys for six sevens when we're done. Hummingbirds beat their wings around 50 times per second, true or false? Now, there's some nuance here, but Joe did make clear a specific amount for the average for hummingbirds. So who was paying attention? Let's see. 94. We had 100 kids now. 98. Oh, I want it. Hey, 100 kids. Way to go, everybody. Okay. The answer is, of course, true. And 91% of you got that right. That's spectacular. All right, leading into our final question. The leaderboard is just, it's stable now. Is there going to be a big upset? Which monkey is not found in Costa Rica? Howler, vervet, spider, or squirrel? The end of our presentation. Who is paying attention to the kinds of monkeys and what is our odd monkey out here? Hmm. We have a small clue. The odd one out is found in Africa, and we've seen them when we do live events from uh, Old Pegida with the rhinos. Vervet, most of you got that right. Way to go. Hopefully you get the chance to watch those programs too. Let's check our leaderboard together. And again, give us a shout out if you are any of these students. And then Miss Ardelian, I'm coming to you first. Mr. Markwick right after. Welcome into our teachers that joined in after the broadcast began as well. Nice to have you here. Let's see. Our winner, Proud Oryx with the upset near the end. Way to go. All right. Well, congrats, folks. Thanks for playing along, 100 kids. And uh, Ms. Ardelian, I'm heading to you guys, six, seven, if you want to come on in. You are good to go. Just unmute your mic and you'll be able to ask all the questions you want. Hey, come chat with us. 
Hello everyone, this is a really great trip all the way down to Central America. Awesome. And uh, breaking stereotypes, students were thinking rainforests are only in Brazil. But uh, guess what? There are other countries too. Who has a question? Jerry had a question about, of course, of cost. How much does it cost to make such an exploration? Well, it really depends on how you want to do it. So um, the biggest cost, well, two of them. One is getting there uh, and the other is where you're going to stay. So um, I would say you need about $400 for the flight if you pick the right time of the year. And a good time of the year is right at the end of the rainy season. So I went the last week in November. That's the last week of the rainy season. And then the dry season starts and everything gets way more expensive in the dry season. So if you pick the right season, the flights are a little bit cheaper. So that's maybe about $400. And it just depends on what you want to stay. If you want to stay somewhere like a hostel where you're staying with a group of other travelers from around the world, um, sometimes it's in bunk beds or rooms with four or five other people, you could stay there for as little as $15 or $20 a night. If you want to get super fancy, you can spend over $1,000 a night. So how expensive you visit Costa Rica is totally uh, your choice. Worth noting, too, that Central and South America can classically be quite cheap destinations to go. So if you want to get a, a really big adventure for fairly limited money, I mean, Mexico, too, is a lot of a big tourist destination for a lot of Canadians. I know we've got a lot of Canadians and Americans in the program today. Uh, and so, uh, you know, take that opportunity to go on an adventure. Maybe it's a once in a lifetime thing. Maybe you're lucky enough to be fortunate to get to go to lots of places. But the act of going out and exploring is, is really valuable. And you get to have experiences like Joe shared with us today. Uh, Sudbury, we're going to head to Mr. Marker's class, hoping that the tech is working. I know you guys had a little trouble at the beginning, but... You got the two devices on. <laughs> Let's mute that second one. You should be good now. Yes. Perfect. Is it? Okay. You can hear me okay? No. no. I'll put, uh, you know what, Mr. Markwick, settle that up and I'll come right back to you in just a second. I'm going to head to Mr. Bocci first and then once you got the other device. Just, just... A quick thought for Mr. Markwick, if he connects the devices to the other, I know he's using that smart board. If he connects to the other one, which is disconnected right now, we might get the sound. But worst case scenario, put them in the private chat and we'll see. We'll, we'll come check in live in just a sec, but Mr. Bocci's class, come on in first. Four or fives. Hey guys. Hello. Um, I have a question from Hayden, and she is asking, why do toucans have such colorful bills? Is there a reason? All right. That's a great question. And, um, you know, the a lot of birds, males and females, have different coloration. Uh, and it uh, the males are often a lot brighter so that they're easier for the females kind of to find. And then females can be really choosy when they pick a mate. They're looking for the most colorful uh, male. And then the females are oftentimes a lot uh, kind of drabbier. They're, they're kind of a more of a browner color, color so that they can blend in a little better when they're sitting on the nest and things like that. You don't want predators to spot them easily. Now with the toucans, what I noticed is both the males and females are really brightly colored. Um, and well, there were two things I heard about that. One is that it does help them stand out a little bit in the rainforest. The rainforest is a really busy spot. And so for other toucans to spot others, um, those kind of colorations help them be a little more easily picked out in the trees. And believe it or not, those bright colors can actually help as a little bit of camouflage as well. The rainforest is not, um, you know, a, a dreary place, especially when the sun's hitting full on. It's full of colors, full of greens and blues and browns and uh, you know, they're, they can actually hide pretty well with some of that coloration. So uh, part of it is so that they can find each other. Uh, and part of it is it actually does provide a little bit of camouflage, even though you might not believe it. Yeah, very cool question, guys. All right, let's head back to Sudbury, hoping for the tech. And then Miss Melnitz, we're coming to you guys next. Mr. Mark Rick. I don't think we can do no, that's okay. So just put them in the chat and I'll, I'll come in and share them in just a sec. I'm sorry that the tech's giving you trouble, but nice to have you guys in today. Nice to see you again. Uh, Ms. Melnitz, come on in, unmute your mic, come join us. Uh, they're in Boldensville. Nice to have Palmer Elementary in. Hey, everyone. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> Jenna has a question. Jenna, can you flow? How many species of birds are there? 
no pressure, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, and I don't remember off the top of my head, so I'm going to use my friend Google. But before I do, uh, I want to tell you about a super awesome uh, tool that I use in Costa Rica. Let me see if I can pull it up on my phone really quickly here. Um, this was turned, this was showed to me by a naturalist who took us out in the field a few times. And this is a really cool app by the Cornell um, uh, Bird Institute. And basically you can take this app and put it on your phone and then you can um, download bird packs forever in the world that you're visiting. And then it puts all the birds that you're likely going to see there and you can identify them as you make your way through these places, through the rainforest. It even has the calls of the birds. So even if you don't see the bird and you just hear a call, you can identify um, that bird species by their call. So it's an amazing app. Check it out by the Cornell uh, Institute. It's really, really cool. And so the number that I am getting for the number of birds in Costa Rica Oh, that didn't work. I, I, got, nine, I got 903. That sounds about right. There's a so lot. There's yeah. way, more than, way more than Canada, I would imagine. And I was lucky enough to see well over 100 species and photograph them. So pretty amazing. And actually, while we're here, maybe I will show you my tool. <laughs> this is my Nikon D500. Let me back up a little bit here and give you a little <laughs> bit of a better view. This oh. is what I was using out in the rainforest. You can see what it has there. So that was for some of those uh, amazing close-ups. Or, and then also I had a, other lenses like this one. This is a 40 millimeter lens for macro. So all those night photos you saw where I got really tight on those frogs, insects and things like that, I was using this little macro lens here. Amazing. By the way, we had uh, Ashwarya Shridhar uh, joined us to start the week. She's an Indian wildlife filmmaker and there's a picture of her with a camera where I swear the camera's bigger than she is. Like she's holding it, it's like at her neck and it goes down to the ground. So it's quite amazing that, you know, some of these great shots are from a very, very far distance to some very specialized tools. And I love that we got to showcase that. Um, I'm going to head to Mount Pearl, Miss Tucker's class in my home of Newfoundland. Uh, so if you guys want to come in for a question, I'll come to you. And then we'll go to West Glen and Mr. Stillman. We are getting near the end of the live broadcast timing too. So I will note that we are going to have a Padlet as well. So a virtual whiteboard, you guys are going to be able to share additional questions after the fact inundate joe with all your costa rica questions uh that's what we we signed up for so please do feel free to send some questions to that and i'll make sure every teacher has that link but mount pearl grade sevens if you guys want to come on in just unmute your mic and you're good to go hey. yeah. okay joshua go ahead hey, 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 hey. 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 how many species are there in the lake costa rica rainforest yeah how many total we've gone from birds to all the species joe we're, we're just leveling up <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, the Osa Peninsula is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Costa Rica is biodiverse enough uh, on its own. There's about half a million species in Costa Rica alone. So let's think about that for a second. We've identified roughly somewhere between one to two million different species. There's probably up to 10 million species. Uh, on the planet. We haven't found them all, identified them all. It takes time. Some of them are really small. Some of them are deep in the ocean, deep in the rainforest, up in the tree canopy. There's about half a million species in Costa Rica, 300,000 of which are insects, which is pretty wild. And then when you zero down to the Osa Peninsula itself, it is a biological hotspot. There is two and a half percent of the planet's biodiversity in this small little peninsula on the coast of Costa Rica. It's pretty amazing. We, uh, when we did the bird question earlier, so there's more species of bird. There's twice as many species of bird in Costa Rica as there are in Canada. And Costa Rica could fit comfortably in Southern Ontario, like where a lot of our yeah. classes are today. So it's a really special part of the world and sort of a testament to the fact that when you leave wildlife space to be alone and to have a beach where it just meets the coast and, and you're not it meets the rainforest and you don't have it full of resorts that you'll have that level of wildlife i also love whenever we have uh rainforest explorers or ocean explorers pretty much every time scientists go out and study these places 
they find new species. So every time a research expedition goes into a place like Costa Rica looking for new species, they'll find them. And it's a testament to the fact that there's so much still to learn on this planet. Great question, guys. Um, let's head to Wes Glenn Jr. If you guys want to come on in, unmute your mic, and I'll head to Mr. Stillman to wrap up in a sec. Hi, four Hello, five. everyone. Hello. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Um, how many monkey species are there in Costa Rica? Yeah. All right, great question. So there's only four, four species in Costa Rica. And then some places you visit might only have one or two, uh, but the Osa Peninsula is pretty lucky because it has all three species. We've got those howler monkeys waking me up every morning at five. Oh. We've got the little squirrel monkeys. We've got the spider monkeys those acrobats through the trees using those tails like a fifth uh, limb. Uh, and then of course we can't leave out um, our capuchins, the white faced capuchins in their little family groups. So four species and on any given day, you could easily see all four of them, which was pretty cool. That is really cool. We got a quick question on YouTube for one of our teachers and then Mr. Stelman, I promise I'm coming. I'm and Jesse, don't, yep. uh, we you know, we, we don't have to knock off right at, at quarter two. All if right. classrooms want to stick around a few minutes extra, uh, I'm here. So we can go a little longer. All right. Well, Miss Collins then on, on YouTube wants to know if you have tarantulas and if you saw any when you were there in Costa Rica. So there are some tarantula species. I wasn't lucky enough to see uh, any, which was a bummer. We did see some wolf spiders at night. So they were maybe about, you know, maybe about like that. But I was really hoping to see some of the big uh tarantulas out at night um i have seen them before i lived in australia for a year and they have these beautiful giant huntsman spiders uh that you'll often find in your 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 house because they don't insulate in australia they don't put weather stripping on the doors or insulate so you'll often come in and find these big huntsman spiders on your wall which is pretty cool Pretty cool is is one phrase for it. It's very it's very exciting. As long as you like leave them, they, they just take over the room. And like the kitchen's theirs now from then on. Uh, Mr. Stelman's class, grade fives in Burlington, come on in and uh, take us away. Hey guys, go for it, Aranisha. How was the weather there? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I was lucky enough to come kind of right at the transition between the the wet season and the dry season. I just want to double check. Uh, how much rain they get in Costa Rica in the wet season. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the weather that I had. So, okay. So <laughs> Costa Rica uh, uh, during the wet season has an average rainfall of about 100 inches. So that's uh, a lot of rain. If you get right into the rainforest mountain region, it can be up to 25 feet of rain a year. That is a wild amount of rain. And even in the dry season, you can expect a little rainstorm to move through in the afternoon. It's just what happens. And that's why it stays so beautiful and lush and, and full of life. Now, I kind of had a mixture. It's kind of a kind of roll of the dice, the time of year that I chose. Um, it was beautiful and green and lush because the rain season was just wrapping up. We had maybe one day where it rained for the majority of the day. Most days you'd get up in the morning, it would be clear and sunny. And then towards the afternoon, something might move in, a little rainstorm, a little thunderstorm, and it would eventually move out. Sometimes two or three would move through during the day. So, and then one day it was just sunny all day long. So I think I got pretty lucky. I got to experience kind of the best of, of both worlds. And temperature, like leaving in November from Canada to there was a big, big improvement? It's a uh, it's a different kind of heat. It is a very humid heat where it's pretty much pushing 30 degrees uh, or higher every day. And you are covered in a layer of dripping sweat all day long. It's just wonderful what you do in the <laughs> rainforest. But I'm really glad we highlighted the rain because, again, when people see green, they see tropical rainforests all around the world. Like that gets to be that lush because of that rain and it creates its own rain. So that's the thing with rainforests in general is that they create their own ecosystems and have this perpetual sort of storm going on because of them, because of the water that comes out of the trees. So I, I'm really glad we got the chance to highlight that. I know some of our classes do need to go for recess or lunch now, so I will note again, if you have additional questions you don't get answered live, uh, head to the Padlet. Again, type in your question. Joe can get to that in the next day or so. Uh, and I put that in the chat for everybody on YouTube and in our private chat. But let's head back to Ms. Ardalian's class. We'll take as many questions as we can over the next few minutes and uh, come on in and unmute your mic. Hey, guys. 
Six sevens, come back. <laughs> Why, bro? The Why? six sevens had many questions to ask. Um, we will ask one of them. What do local residents or, or authorities do in order to preserve and conserve this area, which is so diverse? Yeah, that is such a good question. Costa Rica is really kind of a like a poster country for protecting um, their resources. They realized very quickly and early on that the fruits and the coffee and all the other, um, you know, fruits and vegetables and things like that, that they grow are a huge importance to the economy. And you can't grow those things, that type of agriculture without rainforest. And they also realize that tourism, ecotourism is such an important way to earn tourism dollars, to earn money for the country. So as such, it's well over 20% of the country is completely protected national park, which is an amazing amount for such a small country. Um, and it's when you're in Costa Rica, even in a big city like San Jose, you don't feel like you're in a big city. Uh, the airport's really small uh, with a certain number of flights coming in each day, small little domestic airport with tiny little planes jumping from place to place. And many of the tourism places are eco resorts. So they capture and reuse their rainwater. They have solar paneling, all kinds of things they do to protect the rainforest. Because at the end of the day, you could have a chunk of land and you could clear that land off and maybe make $400 selling the timber. But you can only do that once. Whereas if you protect that land, you grow rainforest friendly crops on it. You save it for national park or ecotourism that little piece of land can be worth thousands and thousands of dollars a year, every single year. So that's something that Costa Rica has figured out and they are doing a really good job protecting their wild places. I think we have the chance to feature so many countries around the world in these broadcasts. And I think Rwanda and New Zealand are the only other countries that really have these big things in place to, to make sure that ecotourism is done sustainably, it's done well to protect the wildlife there. Costa Rica specifically, we have the Friends of the Rainforest team come on and they noted that Costa Rica's rainforest was down to about 20% of the country was rainforest. They cut a lot of it down by the 80s and they had this sort of national conversation to bring it back and now it's over 50% of the country is covered by forest, which is an incredible turnaround. They sort of are the model in the world for great uh, you know ecotourism model and, and sustainability for their, their natural habitat so i'm really glad we got that question all right folks we got time for two more questions so let's head to mount pearl first and then miss melnitz in new york you guys can wrap us up but newfoundland come on back in hey guys hi guys um when the turtles come back to lay eggs uh, where do they go because they didn't did they get moved Okay, so the sea turtles themselves, um, they come back to, uh, you know, the same kind of area where they were born. And so they come up onto the beach, they dig a nest, they lay their eggs, they cover it up, and then they head back into the ocean. Now, sometimes species like the leatherback sea turtle, that's the largest sea turtle, can weigh over a thousand pounds. Um, they will lay, do that over and over and over again. So they might lay six or seven nests. So like 700 eggs in total. And again, that's because the more eggs, the more chance that some of them are going to survive. Now, the reason that the hatchery at Osa Conservation, they dig up those nests and move them is because predators are looking for those nests, like the agoutis and, uh, or sorry, the, the kinkajous and the, um, the raccoons. They'll dig those nests up and they'll eat those turtle eggs it's a great snack. Uh, so they, by moving the nest, putting them somewhere protected, they all hatch. And then by protecting them as they get make their way to the shore, you keep the birds away. Frigate birds, vultures, all kinds of birds are waiting for those baby sea turtles. And they're a really easy snack out there. So the big sea turtles aren't moved. They lay their nest. They go back into the water. Then the eggs are dug up and then they're put uh, into the hatchery, and then they can be released. I love the nuance in that question. Anytime we talk baby sea turtles, I'm actually surprised we didn't get more questions today, but they're such a special thing to experience for all of them. So I'm so jealous of you, Joe. It's a very fun thing. I've seen video of that to the little kid. Um, Miss Melvin's class, Pearl Palmer, if you guys want to come on in for one final question, unmute your mic, and you are good to go. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. How dangerous is it to walk around? 
Okay, good question. Uh, not very. There are venomous snakes. There's different species of vipers like the um, fertile ants uh, and the bushmaster. But during the day, they kind of curl up into little buttresses of the big trees. So some a lot of the trees have these roots that kind of come out of the ground and they have these little kind of cave areas almost where the buttresses, the roots meet. And so they like to hide out in there during the day. So when you're walking around in the rainforest, you don't have a lot to worry about from them. Uh, at night, they get active and they're hunting a little bit more. So again, when you're walking around, you have your flashlight or your headlamp and you're just aware of where you're walking. Um, I didn't see any of the vipers, which was a bummer. I was really hoping to see them. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is we wear these big wellies, these big boots, yep. and those protect you as well. So let's say you accidentally stepped on one uh, and it bit your ankle. Well, those wellies are pretty good protection um, from something like that. And again, they don't want to bite you. They're only going to do it if you step on them or they feel threatened. I'm uh, glad you're in the same boat as I am. Like that would have been my main goal. I love snakes and the Bushmaster particularly is such a, what a, it's a great name for a snake. It's a very yeah. cool snake. Fair de Lance too. I hope our classes take the chance to look that up. I'll put that in an email. I should up. just add too that there are jaguars, there are pumas. And another huge bummer is I didn't get to see either one. They are very elusive. They yeah. know you're coming way before uh, <laughs> you know they're around and they generally just move off. Yeah. Uh, I did see puma scat. So uh, on one of the days we were hiking, we did see a big pile of fur and bones uh, that a puma, uh, well, had pooped out. Uh, so that was as close as I got to seeing one of the big cats. You'll have to go back and stay in one of those hostels this yeah. time. It's like a cheaper alternative. Yeah. yeah. Um, Joe, is there a final message you want to share with our kids about Costa Rica, your experience there before we bring in everyone to say a big thank you and farewell? Anything to leave with about the Osa Peninsula? Yeah, I think it's just worth mentioning that uh, we are losing our biodiversity. We're losing our biodiversity all over the world. Um, the rate of that we're losing it is faster than the replenishment. So uh, what that means is naturally we gain species and we lose species. It happens. But the rate that we're losing them now is way faster than the replenishment weight. So Biodiversity is so important to our planet, to everything that we produce, to everything that we eat, to the functioning of healthy ecosystems, to protection from pandemics. Our biodiversity is wildly important. As we lose that biodiversity, ecosystems start to crash. Every little piece, every little animal and plant is important to that ecosystem. So I think the thing to take away from it is to look at countries like Costa Rica, who are protecting their biodiversity, who are doing a great job of it. And even here in Canada or the United States, where we have our viewers today, we can do things to protect our biodiversity, whether it's gardens in your yard, bee friendly lawns uh, and things like that. So your home can be a little special connection, a little corridor that an animals, plants and insects can use to move from place to place. So we can protect our biodiversity at home too, like they do in Costa Rica. Spectacular. No better message to end than that. We love featuring conservation programs here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And pretty much no matter where people are working or showcasing around the globe, that is the message. You can take positive action wherever you happen to be joining from. Uh, and I hope you take that opportunity. Do reach out to the two of us if you want more resources, ideas on how to do that. Uh, and just thank you all so much for joining us today. Again, in our first week of programs back in 2023. Joe, you certainly know this well. I'm going to bring in our three classes. This Mel, this Mount Pearl, and this Arlene to say a big thank you and farewell. Uh, so come on in, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon, and uh, we'll see you again soon.